Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the last session of the 2019 Plumbers. Um, hopefully, you guys have all been enjoying yourself and have been effective at solving some problems, which is what Plumbers is all about. Um, what we'll be doing right now is just going through um, a couple of closing remarks, and then we will be having a plenary from Thomas Gleixner, and then we'll be giving you directions on how to get to the dinner, and there'll be buses coming to take us there. So, <laughs> the, okay, the important part, right? Yeah, fair enough. Well, um, if you've got comments during the session, please just uh, stand up and wait for a mic to come to you so it can all get recorded. And with that, I will start off with saying uh, thank you very much to our, our diamond sponsor, Facebook. Uh, if you could give them a round of applause because they've helped provide a lot of this stuff for us all. We've also had some wonderful platinum sponsors this year. Um, Google, Intel, and NetApp have all um, helped making this event possible for you guys. Our gold sponsors, Arm, Dell, Microsoft Azure, and Western Digital have contributed in as well, as has our silver um, sponsors. So we've had a wonderful suite of sponsors this year that's helped make this actually the biggest, probably, plumbers event ever. So if you could join me in thanking them. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed lunch. And tonight is being sponsored by Google. Um, the catch boxes, I think, were much more effective this year. And I don't think we have any injuries <laughs> from them. <laughs> we had one injury. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> hopefully not too serious. And then thank you to VMware for our t-shirts and to LWN.net for the hosting our website for, the pro for plumbers and our airline sponsor, TAP. So <laughs> that has been our sponsor suite. So it's the best set of sponsors we've had up till now. And obviously, special thanks to the Linux Foundation, in particular, Megan, Trisha, and Courtney, who have actually kept this going so smoothly. Very much appreciate them. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. So uh, just a piece of you know, cleanup. Um, the microconference um, participants for the runners, can you please make sure that the presenters have all the slides uploaded and the etherpads are up to date? If you could do that, that'd be great. The information should be coming up uh, shortly. And combined with the videos, it'll hopefully be a nice full package for people to, who weren't able to join us this year. This year, we actually had over 100 plus on the wait list that we could not accommodate. So uh, it's really important that we actually be able to communicate the information to them that weren't able to join us. And so some of the numbers that we did have, though, is we had a, a new track this year. We tried a BOF track. And we had 18 spots on it, and we ended up with 21. So we ended up spilling out to some others. So the BOF track seemed to be fairly effective and successful for people. Oh. That's interesting. Do I need to watch how I step? OK. <laughs> we'll step back. Um, we had three referee tracks. And so thank you to the committees from the Colonel um, and then the networking. Uh, committee as well as our plumbers committee for the referee tracks. This year we had we had 18 microconferences going simultaneously now. Um, last year was just 13. So we're up by five more microconferences and hopefully that helped solve a few more problems. Um, before we started, there were 60 presentations uploaded. Way to go. <laughs> that makes it easier for people to follow things in advance, definitely. And there's 11 and 11 now, and hopefully we can get the rest of them up there in the next week or so. Um, we had 123 hours of scheduled content. There were 220 talks, actually, on the agenda this time. With, and this came in from 340 abstracts. And we had 520 registered people uh, participating. Um, 234 of those were speaking. And when I checked this morning, there were only four badges that were not picked up by the attendance in this session. So everyone who really, who came want, you know, anyone who wanted awesome attendance, that's just what I'm gonna say. 
Um, to sort of give you guys a feeling of who's here, um, we actually had a really good, diverse group from around the world. And um, we've got a lot of people who have come across from the US, so thank you to them for getting on planes and uh, dealing with the jet lag. And then thank you to the people who've come from far away, like China and the other, Brazil and so forth. Um, hopefully the discussions made it worthwhile. Um, I also like to thank my, the existing members of the organizing committee who've helped to pull this together. Um, Guy Lenardi has basically been handling our social media as well as our webs our schedules. Uh, Elena, who's basically did a very thankless job of trying to deal with our wait list and our registrations. So thank you again, Elena, for dealing with that mess. <laughs> Much appreciated. We've got to figure out something better next year. And um, I think you've already been receiving notes from James, and he's been helping a lot with um, making sure things keep going smoothly, as well as he's been working, keeping an eye on our finances for us this year. And then John has been doing social media, as well as helping out wherever he possibly can, and much appreciated for that. Um, Laura has been helping out, and Laura will be the chair for next year for us. <laughs> and then a uh, big thank you to Steve for handling the mini mini comps and having such a successful program of mini comps this year. Um, and then Paul McKinney is our program chair and managing our referee tracks and all the content for the BOFs and so forth. So thank you to them. And then Jake's been doing our blogs. David Woodhouse um, has basically managed to help fill in the gaps and get the speaker gifts and so forth. So I want to say thank you to all of them, but also thank you very much to Rui Silva, who's been our local um, advisor and driving us around when necessary and helping us to translate to Portuguese when we get confused. So again, thank you very much to Rui for helping us all out this year. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Hi everyone, on behalf of the Linux Foundation Technical Advisory Board, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone who participated in our election this year. As you may know, we did something different this year. Instead of doing in-person voting, we went and did electronic voting. We had 174 people who responded to our voting for the tab, and I'd like to congratulate our existing, our new tab members, and I look forward to working with them on the tab in for another successful year. And I'd also like to take this time to uh, make sure we give an, another special round of applause for Kate, who was the chair this year for Plumbers. <laughs> yes. She did a fantastic job making sure running meetings and we were all staying on track. Okay. And without further ado, I'd like to now introduce our closing keynote speaker, uh, Thomas Gleixner. He's well known in the kernel community for working on real time, and he's here to give us a very entertaining talk. So, Thomas. Thank you for the introductions. Um, I got asked to give the keynote and uh, wondered what to talk about. Um, up to the point where it occurred to me that there are several anniversaries uh, happening around this time. So I thought it's good to look back um, and talk about dreams, which you need to have to get something done. But when you have dreams, you also have that other ugly side effect, which is nightmares. <laughs> so there should be some slides somewhere. Push there. Oh, <laughs> I'm dragging those uh, drawings around for a long time. My daughter did them back then when I talked about the embedded nightmare <laughs> many years ago. Oh, it's gotten better. So when you go back in time, you want to go roughly to the beginning. That was 1991. It has made people angry. Just think about the Tannenbaum debate. <laughs> so shortly after that, 
I discovered this Linux thingy because somebody told me this is this cool stuff out there. I was doing uh, hardware design and designing microcontrollers into uh, motion control systems. And because back then there was no software division, obviously the stupid guy who decided to put a microcontroller on the PCB had also to do the firmware. So my operating system back then was very easy, main program loop and the timer interrupt. Cool. No caches, no speculation, nothing of <laughs> So but this Linux thing, it was interesting for me because as I came from hardware engineering and I have no clue about software, it, I wanted to look how such an operating system looks inside. Uh, this was very interesting because back then it was 25,000 lines of code so you could read it. Um, the only person who got ever angry about that thing was my wife. So, Fast forward, in 1999 I decided no, I don't want to do that hardware stuff anymore and want to do something else. So I was following Linux development, I was sending randomly patches when my boxes broke. And then I said, okay, this thing is going to take off in the industrial space as well. Most people looked at me and said, you're totally crazy. Which didn't surprise me, but I know that I'm crazy, so. And, but the crazy thing is something which follows through that talk because that comes up every once and so often. Uh, but then I realized, oh yes, that was one of the nightmares. There's no real-time support. We'll go from the air. Um, thankfully, there were academics out there who did a really good job in creating weird uh, variants of real-time systems on top of or underneath of Linux. So it was, I was working on and off on RTAI, RT Linux, and then I discovered the Kansas University variant, which was very close to what we are doing today. And this was all interesting. I got some other projects to work on started to work on NAND flash because a customer decided that NAND flash is well supported in the kernel, which was not. Um, so, and this was the first time I discovered one really bad thing. You go there, look at a piece of code and fix it and it turns out nobody cares about it at all. And then somebody says, oh, you've got an, an entry in the maintainers file. You touched it, you own it. <laughs> Have, happened several times. And NAND flash was by far the least ugly of all that. So, and then, 2004. I do a quick quiz on those quotes. They are all from the big real-time debate on Alchem L, which spawned off a single email and I looked it up, the email thread is more than 2,600 mails. <laughs> uh, it derailed in tons of things, so, so you can paint a really nice tree of it. So, I go through each item, you raise your hands, uh, and the question I'm asking you is, is this a Linux quote? So, real-time people are totally crazy. <laughs> friends, let not use friends' priority inheritance. <laughs> oh, interesting. Not going to happen ever. <laughs> Just go away. <laughs> use a microkernel for the real-time thing and be done with it. All of them are Linus. <laughs> Who would have thought? I mean, I, I guessed that nobody would think that Linux would recommend the microkernel. <laughs> but in that context, he actually did. So 
once that settled down, uh, we started to work on it, and it worked perfectly fine, except for a few things. <laughs> RCU, timers, deadlocks, deadlocks, deadlocks. So the thing was, with RCU, we looked into RCU, Ingo Molnar and I, and said, uh, this code cannot be understood. <laughs> so we went off, wrote mail to Paul McKenney and said, Paul, we are in trouble. Ten minutes later, we got a reply from Paul. I knew that long ago that you're in trouble, and I start <laughs> I already started working on it. <laughs> that was fun. Timers, well, that was another interesting part. It's really old code back then already. Nobody cared about it. Had interesting features, and then the deadlocks. All devlocks we experienced in RT were real devlocks in the mainline kernel. So Ingo and I spent an awful lot of time to decode all those deadlocks and fix them. And at, at some point, we really got tired of it because we wanted to get this other stuff done. So we came up with LockDAP. I know most people hated LockDAP when we brought it into the kernel. What I think uh, most people love it today. Uh, so yeah, it was fun. So, but this enabled us to do a first production-ready version in 2006, which was cool. Um, and then we went on and tried gradually to merge the stuff we came up with uh, into the mainline kernel, and one of it was HR timers in no hertz. Uh, Linus wanted to have no hertz. Uh, it came, unfortunately, bundled with HR timers. That there was no way to rip that apart. Sorry, Linus, about that. Um, but then, shortly before we were about to merge it, somebody sent me a bug report uh, uh, against x86-64. So I was traveling and sat in a boring meeting and looked at the code and said, hey, yeah, that's an easy fix sent the patch out, got confirmed, fixes x86. An hour later, I got an angry email, you broke 32-bit. Well, wait a moment. I touched a file in Arch x86-64. How the hell can I break Arch i386? Digging deeper, I found eight different ways <laughs> how x86-64 and i386 shared files. Some links, make file references, direct includes, and other totally ugly tricks. Um, okay, I looked at the both thingies which I broke and said, why aren't these things all in one directory? So, yes, that started off that I looked into merging the two architectures, which took Ingo and me two years not working on real time because we merged x86 together. Um, yeah, it was really interesting. And that's the nightmare to it. Uh, I didn't quote the full mail because that's not co co uh, code of conduct compliant anymore. <laughs> Um, so yes, then the following years we were busy doing x86. Uh, by that time we, just as a side project, we started Proof. And at some point I went back to uh, work on RT, uh, which then ran, I got exposed because while doing all that I got several other in entries into the maintainer file, which then exposed me to patches. And a lot of them are enterprise quality. <laughs> so how does that look like? That's mostly voodoo, duct tape, works for me, ioctals, 
that sized and totally random other things. Nothing of it makes sense, but you have to fend it off. So that's yeah, still hunting me. I could whip up that slide every, every, every other slide. So that's still true today. Um, so over time, I learned how to better how to deal with that. Uh, my first reactions to that were probably just um, my grumpy self. Um, so, and this is something I'm really deeply care about, and we need to get better at that. Uh, one of the important things people have to really understand, you can't just solve your particular problem by gluing something into the code. That doesn't work. It works for you, but it doesn't work for everybody else and especially not for the maintainers because you got your problem solved, you go away, you do some work on something else and the fallout from what you did is coming back to the maintainers and they have to deal with it. So the defense line of me, for me and of maintainers in general should be say no. Do it right, do it proper. So I had one thing last year going on. I looked at it and said, yeah, makes sense, but no. This breaks here, breaks there, and whatever. So we have to go and clean it up, clean up the whole logic and magic behind it. And I told the submitter that, and he came back with the answer, that's out of the scope of my project. He got a reply from me, very polite. Now it is in the scope of your project. <laughs> he actually did it. He cleaned it up and was happy about it afterwards that he actually went all down the road and did the whole restructuring because it made a lot of the things he actually wanted to do easier, simpler, cleaner. So and I think that's something I'm doing that, and I think every maintainer in the tree should do that for his own mental sanity. Because uh, you're going to be haunted by the, by the stuff you, you get thrown at. So 2009, 2012 was just doing, working on RT on and off, doing a little bit maintainer work, whatever. And then I ran into that other enterprise problem. Uh, everybody was telling me they use RT, they love RT, but nobody wanted to pay for it. So in 2014, I actually decided to make it a hobbyist project, and I got the most hilarious emails from all over the world. You cannot do this. Our products depend on it. <laughs> I sent the form letter reply, I can tell you where the slot is, where you can drop the shack in. Uh, they started to panic, but uh, you know, don't panic. So people were thinking actually about solutions for the problem. OSADL stepped in for a year and then uh, the Linux Foundation real-time project uh, was uh, put together. Thank you, Kate. Um, and we were really were able to work uh, in earnest on it. There's a lot of work, what we achieved in that time. Um, and we really went down and did it from ground up. We fixed hot block, which was interesting. The CPU hot blocks cleanup it took us only 650 patches up to the point where we also switch the locking over to something which is visible to LockDap, which caused LockDap to unearth all the existing deadlocks, which were well hidden, which caused another 110 feet patches to fix that mess. So, yeah, it's fun. But then, in 2018, this got we were plugging along, we were all happy, and then we got, uh, no, in 17, we were disrupted by this. <laughs> yeah, that was my first reaction to it. Because uh, not 
due to the technical problem, I knew immediately what was coming along with the technical problem and what would be worse than the technical problem. Because of all the secrecy of all the other uh, companies and operating system vendors involved, it would end up in a really stupid nightmare of bureaucracy, politics, and lawyers. Now, if you were at your literature class and paying attention, you know that there's a well-known solution from a very famous uh, British uh, writer, what to do with the lawyers. <laughs> but that doesn't work, folks. It violates the code of <laughs> So we have to deal with it and have to cope with it. We're still suffering from it. Uh, some of you might have noticed that we have a, a documented process, what we think, and this is the only way because we as a community cannot sign NDAs and companies have finally to understand that. They ref we are telling them this for years, but now they have it written, so maybe that helps better uh, for their attempts of trying to understand it. I don't know. We'll see. So after that, we went back to work, dealt with the second wave, which was way better to deal with, but still annoying. And then, uh, yeah, somewhere, summer last year, we got the other thing which just made people run around and screaming and discuss everything in totally unordered ways. Um, it's the cock, but it happened. We are over with it, and I think we are all happy it's there in the form we have it. So I'm not complaining. It just was yet another thing to happen out of the blue. And what the hell is or or people I need for reviewing something. Oh, they are off at discussing code of conduct issues. Great. Um, 2019, we got back to normal. We started to f make progress with our backlog. Uh, we actually have most of the big items which we um, need to solve to get uh, finally this thing done. Uh, in shape and in tree, the last outstanding issue, the big one was print K, and we, I think we agreed on a solution on this very conference. So Plumbus has done what it should do, bring people together so they can sit down and hash it out in person. The discussion was n not longer being resolvable on, by mail, so beca because. No particular reason it happens. So that's what conferences are for. And why I really look back, and it's 15 years now that I'm working on RT, uh, on the real-time preemption patch set, pretty much 15 years now. And it's almost exactly 20 years from now when I started to look in how real-time could be supported on a Linux kernel. And I was sure back then it works. I'm even more sure now, even if the academics still claim that it can't work. But we had this microconference session today where we were talking about that, and uh, one of the academics actually ac admitted himself that what they are doing is they have all these nice computations where I prove whether something works or not. But they also have a gazillion of assumptions where they just say, this, does, this problem doesn't exist. So I'm grateful that academics looking into that problem, but I also think they need to go and figure out that there are these assumptions which really should exist in order to figure out whether something works or not. So, yes, uh, 
And that's where we are. We got finally some signal in into the kernel. Uh, the config preempt RT switch is there. You can't turn it on yet. It's hidden behind a dependency, but it allows us to do some of the depending stuff on top of it, and we will just do that in the way we've done it in the last 15 years, polish it up, make Linus happy, and get it done. And that brings me to an interesting question. I got asked over the years over and over, and I got asked it a couple of days ago. How do you get crazy shit into the Linux kernel? <laughs> There's a very easy answer to that, and it's actually coming from Linus himself. The real-time people have actually been pretty good at slipping their stuff in in small increments, and always with good reasons why they aren't crazy. <laughs> so I, I told you there's this crazy thing. Uh, and yeah, I still think the hard real-time people are mostly crazy. I guess this is true today. Come on, admit it. <laughs> so, Linus can work with crazy people, he's saying. It just wants them to wrap their crazy stuff into these Trojan horses, not talk about the soldiers in an inside, make him, give him this warm and cozy feeling that he's merging something really useful. I mean, you know that about the soldiers inside, but as long as the the, the, the gift package is uh, nicely wrapped. You don't care, right? So uh, that's my answer to how you get crazy stuff into the Linux kernel. But there's a second answer to it. Go and work from ground up. Don't try to bolt on things into the kernel because that's going to hurt us, everybody, and you in the long, in the long term as well. Uh, so yes, it's a lot of extra work you're doing, but then this is also something where you can lay the groundwork for your crazy stuff. So of course, when, I, when we reworked uh, CPU hot plug, aside of making it actually work for the first time ever, uh, we carefully made it in a way that it won't break on RT again, which is, Okay, I think. Uh, so, as long as it works. Um, so yes, this is my answer. This one and the other one, do it from ground up. Go, go the extra mile, it's, it's worth it. It's worth for the, for the quality of the kernel, for the stability of the kernel. Don't do the duct tape thing. So, I came up with a picture of what I was doing the last 15 years. It's feeling like changing every uh, wheel on a running train. So, but you're not alone changing wheels. Other people are changing wheels as well in random orders, and some people put, think it's a good idea to put squared wheels on. <laughs> so once they realize they don't work, instead of changing them again and use round wheels, they use duct tape to make them round. <laughs> so the problem is, at some point, the duct tape falls apart and you're back to the, the original state, so you should have used a round wheel and not insisted on repairing your square wheel with weird means. So yes, that's things I deeply care about, and I think, that's something every maintainer in the tree should care about. Don't proliferate duct tape programming. That's, yeah, I know duct tape programming is the most common thing in industry. I mean, I, from my company work, I occasionally can, I'm forced to look into customer code 
That's not a pleasant experience. You see, oh yes, 100 lines of code and 50 lines are commented out. And you see exactly what they tried to do in order to make it work. And then you have the if, if, if zero thing is, and you can't even re figure out which code is actually doing what. Because there's so much information, but it c contains all the history of failed attempts. It's gray. Yeah, you, no, no, my theory is this whole industry is just working by chance. There's no plan. <laughs> so, uh, with that, if you have questions I can answer, I'm happy to do so. If not, I'm want to thank you for your attention and leave you off to the party. And that's... <laughs> that's, my, that's my dream I'm going to dream on for now. <laughs> and don't provide me wake nightmares anymore. <laughs> I just want to have this cozy dream forever. <laughs> Okay, if anyone wants to ask questions, if you could raise your hand and stand up, we'll try to get you a mic. Okay. Uh, your description of the uh, changes in the interesting code you're looking at from industry, isn't that a description of evolution in action? Yes, it's evolution in action, but <laughs> it's a weird form of evolution. <laughs> <laughs> and the outcome <laughs> is... the Contrary to normal evolution, which extincts bad things. Like, like this, your appendix? This proliferates the bad things. So there's something wrong with that analogy. Um, I, could, I could go through a bunch of taxonomy and zoological curiosities, but I'll, I'll leave it to <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyone else? Oops. Thomas, now you're getting close to actually finishing uh, merging like the preempt patches. What do you actually want to do next? What, what are you going to occupy your time with for <laughs> like the next 20 years? <laughs> Dreaming. <laughs> Having time for grandkids. Go on vacation. Eventually make retirement plans. Now, uh, I, uh, I have no, no real plans yet, but I guess the things which are on this one directional uh, file, which is named to-do list, <laughs> is large enough to keep me busy f for the next five decades. <laughs> not that I want to get that old. This is actually your request, not a question. Once you finally have finished drill time, can you provide us a retrospective roadmap, please? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually let someone who understands uh, how to draw that thing is do that. So, so I, I hire an MBA or so. <laughs> what is your favorite idea, your favorite part of the RT subsystem? My favorite part of it? I can't tell. Definitely not fuel taxes. <laughs> I can tell you what I do not favor. So we can exclude a lot of things, but no, there's nothing remaining. <laughs> no, I, no, I can't come up with one particular thing. Most horrific, Futex. <laughs> There's an easy answer. That's truly easy question. Uh, second horrific has nothing to do with RT, is the fundamentally broken x86 hardware. <laughs> but we can't fix that in software. 
So with that, you want one more? there's one more. I know I lay, awake, I lay awake at night dreaming of a processor that can context switch in five cycles. No. <sighs> I'm dreaming of a processor which actually does all the things I care about, context switching, entry, and all these things, correct. <laughs> I don't care about the five microseconds. That's, that's a side effect. It comes with it. Once you have it correct, it does that. Um, since you have some uh, expertise in the area, is there a favorite Trojan horse skill you could part impart? <laughs> the Trojan horse, my favorite Trojan horse. I think one of the real good ones was the no Hertz HR timer combo. Linus wanted to have the no hurt thingy solved because the laptops were draining battery like crazy. But the bad news was, once the kernel fixed it, we figured out not only the kernel is draining battery, user spaces is draining even more. <laughs> Guess what? If you ran a, back, a contemporary desktop back then, you were waking up as fast as you can, roughly every 10 milliseconds, just for the clock applet. <laughs> In order to either increase the second hand once per second, or if the second hand was disabled, the minute hand once per minute. Therefore, you woke up for the second hand at least 100 times, and then for you can do the math. Yeah. yeah, but that could fix eventually. Okay. And then other people came up with crazy ideas, what you can do with no hertz, no hertz full, not having a tick at all while running in the user space and things like that, yeah. But that was not part of that Horse package that came later, and I wasn't involved. Mm. Much. <laughs> Uh, mostly not. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're pretty good right now then. And yeah. I'll just give you guys the rest of the information for tonight. And thank, thank you very you much, Thomas. Thank you. Off for the party. <laughs> so there's been questions in the hallways, and we've been trying to get it nailed down, but we don't still quite know our next venue yet. We're in negotiations with two venues. Uh, we're likely going to be back in Canada next year. And uh, we will be putting a blog spot. There'll be a blog coming out in the next couple of weeks as soon as we've got the contracts signed. So watch the space. Uh, we wish we could have told you right now, but it's coming. Tonight's event is going to be at the, centra, uh, the CCB, the Central Cultural Berlin. And there were, are going to be buses starting. Um, pretty much as soon as you exit here. Uh, this, the CCB is right down by the water, by the river. And you can see the Tower de Belem if you sort of look outside. And you can also see the Discoverer's Tower. And so it's in a nice part of the town, um, very tourist, Dick and scenic. Um, and we'll be in this building here. And there's indoor and outdoor that we'll be working from. And the buses will be taking us right to that building and picking it up. And so. The buses will be um, circulating after they've taken us, and the last bus will be departing from the venue at uh, 11 o'clock. The buses are actually going to be, we'll be boarding them from this floor here, so you'll be just going out of here and going that way rather than going down to the main lobby. And we should be able to pick them up in, on this floor here and start to move ourselves over there. Um, badges, please wear them tonight. Since uh, we are going to be making sure that people are coming in with badges for the venue. So I, I guess in closing, thank you again, everyone, every each one of you for making Plumbers so effective this year. Very much appreciated. And if you want to help us make Plumbers better for next year, if you could take five minutes and um, work on a certain Oops, we've got a question. Okay. Um, 
pick up a guest pass at the registration desk. If you've registered, there's a pass there for the person. Okay? And with the survey, and with that, thank you very much. And thank you for the end of Thomas for this year. Just one more thank you to Kate for holding it all together for us.